Hello and welcome to Tales and Trails. I'm Minnie Menon. Women often get a very raw deal in history. They're barely mentioned and most writers and chroniclers actually focus on the politics and the dynasts and the kings. So it's really interesting when you have an author and, and a researcher who's gone in depth to find out the story of the women in a particular era. Well, joining me today is Ira Mukhoti, author of Daughters of the Sun, a fabulous book on the women of the Mughals. Uh, Ira, thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank you for having me. I'm going to start by saying you're not a historian, but you've done such a fabulous piece Thank going you. deep into, um, you know, primary sources, a lot of, of readings to actually piece together a story out of a sliver of information. I think probably an academic wouldn't have had the foolishness to take on an undertaking <laughs> like this, you know, knowing how much work it involved. But uh, yes, I started with the story of Jahanara Begum, whom I'd spoken about in my first book. Mm -hmm. And that led me to the realization that there was a lot of information out there on the women of the Mughals, but it was all lying scattered in a certain way, you know. And it took a lot of patience and I suppose enthusiasm to piece different bits of information, whether from miniatures, from sculptures, from monuments, from some archival uh, written materials to put together what was in fact an extraordinary life over 200 years of these Mughals, women who came in from with Babur and uh, I ended up with the daughters of Aurangzeb and how their influence changed over the course of these 200 years. You know what is interesting is that there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, biases when you come across history uh, of the Mughals, especially with regards to women, yes. because we have a lot of European accounts and for them, the Eastern Empire, the Mughals yes. were a, a, a thing of mystique, women were, you know, they had the Zinana and the harem and all kinds of um, bizarre stories emanating from there, mostly, uh, you know, from gossip yes. on the street or, or, on the, or at the local level. But what you've done is actually put together the story and what comes out is women who are very strong, who were financially powerful, who were uh, people who wielded a lot of authority. Uh, so what was uh, the trigger point and w w what kind of set you on this journey? Jahanira was a, was a great example of She was a great example and you know, being a Delhi woman myself, uh, I was shocked when I realized that she had shaped the city of Shah Jahanabad, which we called Old Delhi now, to such a great extent. And she had so much ambition. And for me, uh, for a 17th century Muslim woman, to see that kind of ambition and the way she elucidated it so clearly in her biographies as well, it was very startling. It, it was also a revelation because, as you say, I had read a lot of colonial rit literature writing about the Mughal women in a certain way. And that certain way was filled with prejudice, as you know, and malice and gossip. And we were all brought up to think of Muslim Mughal women as indolent, as passive, as women who spent their hours just at leisure trying to beautify themselves. <laughs> And when I realized that with this one woman, Jahanar, there was so much unknown information and she was so very much the opposite of what had been portrayed, I wondered how many other women there might possibly be. And that was when I started to, you know, kind of look more deeply into this subject. And I realized that uh, what is portrayed to us often is Mughal women as one chapter. So if you take any of the great books on Mughal history, uh, women are one chapter between maybe, uh, you know, the cuisine of the Mughals and <laughs> ornamentation at the court, there's Mughal women, you know. <laughs> so I realized that that couldn't possibly so, that over 200 years, over 250 years, surely the influence of women changed, it was a dynamic process and they had different ways of showing their influence and that was exactly what I found. You know, and I'm going to start from the beginning because, as you rightly point out, uh, uh, the Mughals trace their lineage to Timur and Cengiz Khan. They were yes. very proud of that origins. And if you go back to Cengiz Khan's own uh, own story, and I've been always fascinated by the man, it came from a very nomadic setup, which is very uh, also um, very equal in terms of gender, because yes. it is a story of his wife, his main uh, wife, you know, getting kidnapped by a rival uh, a tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, she comes back after eight, eight months. She's pregnant. The questions raised about Cengiz's eldest son's, uh, you know, uh, paternal, right. uh, you know, uh, connection, and uh, he adopts the son. She's given pride of place, and that actually repeats itself with Babur's sister. Yes, that was that was an extraordinary story in itself. You know, I think my first chapter is about that because I was, uh, you know, so moved by the fact that they were very pragmatic about the fact that in times of war, women might be captured, they might be taken by the enemy. In fact, in this case, Babur willingly willingly gave his sister over to Shebani Khan Uzbek because he had no other choice. It was the only way for him to secure his future and the possibility of an empire later on. 
But when she was returned to him, you know, she got the respect of the Pacha Begin, which was the most respected woman at court, not only for, for Babur, but for, even for Humayun later on. And she was the most respected woman of both these kings. So it was something for me which was very refreshing when you compare that their exact contemporaries, the Rajput women, were, were kept in a, a, a situation where their sexual chastity was primordial. There was nothing which was more important for a Rajput family than the chastity of their women, so much so that they were expected to commit sati or johar if ever their, their chastity was uh, at risk. Uh, that means that you put a woman's chastity above everything else, above, above her mind, her intellect, her motherhood, everything else is secondary to the fact that she may not be sexually pure. So when you compare that and you compare how pragmatic and in a way stoic the, uh, the Mughals were about their women, it was something to, which to me was actually shocking because I hadn't thought about that and certainly hadn't come across in the history that I had been taught that the Muslims were at that time more progressive about their women and they, uh, they were also more progressive in terms of the education of the women because as you say, whether it was Cengiz Khan or Timur, they both valued the education of their women because really? um, yes, so they were educated, they, they were, were highly educated because a uh, 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 law of the, the Yasa law said that uh, you can judge a man by the, by the uh, status of his wife, his household. That means if you have a highly educated cultured woman, that reflects on you as the, uh, as the man. So that was a very interesting point which meant that their women were highly educated and the young uh, princesses got the same education as their brothers. And it was an eclectic uh, sort of education. It, they had arithmetic, they had philosophy, they had all kinds of, apart from calligraphy and writing. So these were very cultured and educated women because their, one of their jobs was to sort of um, look over, they were guardians of the legacy. So they had to know what Timurid legacy meant, how they could forward it, how they could look after it. So this was their valued role and it meant that they had to be uh, knowledgeable in what uh, Timur Timurid legacy was all about. So that was something which to me was very interesting when I compared it with their like uh, with the, uh, the, the women here, say the Rajput because they came in contact with the Rajput especially, but the Rajput women who were barely educated if at all. And you know what is interesting is that the nomadic roots mm -hmm. kind of uh, echo through, through the entire uh, you know, um, uh, reign of the Mughals because one of the things is that, you know, at, during war or during, uh, uh, you know, trips, they actually take their women yes. with them. I mean, when Babur comes to India, he comes with his sister and his yes. mother and they play a very important role yes. through that. So tell us about how you see each of the, one of the generations evolving. Well, uh, especially for the first two Pachas in the time of Babur and Humayun, they travelled everywhere with their women. There was no idea of a settled space. At that time, they were still establishing their empires and wherever they went, their household followed them. Now, we must remember that this just didn't just mean the wives, it meant their aunts, it meant their sisters, unmarried sisters, widowed sisters, other cousins, other relatives to whom they had given refuge. So it was a large it was extended... It was impractical, wasn't it? It, it was terribly impractical, but somehow this influence was very important to them and they did not go anywhere without this household, mm -hmm. whether it was on pleasure trips or in battlefields. And in famously, in the Battle of Chosa, which Humayun lost against Shea, Shasuri, and where so many of the women died because they were so vulnerable at that time. There wasn't, uh, there were no stone buildings within which to keep these women. So. On the one hand, they were very vulnerable and they were exposed to danger, but on the other hand, they were influential in the day-to-day -day living of the emperor and the way in which he was shaping his empire. Uh, and of course, it was from the time of Akbar that we have a settled space where in Fatehpur Sikri, for the first time, he builds a large palace for his women. Uh, but even so, you see these older women especially, you know, his mother, Hamida Banu Begum, who keeps leaving Fatehpur Sikri to go and follow her son because uh, suddenly she's overcome with the desire to see her son apparently, you know. Mm -hmm or Gulbadan who goes for a seven year journey to the Hajj. What an adventure she had, you know, and clearly she was in no hurry to come back because even when she did return after seven years, uh, Abu al-Fazl writes that instead of hurrying back to court, she goes off to Ajmer to see the Dargah, you know, so she was clearly full of the spirit of adventure, which especially the older Timurid women carried with them through their lives. The older women also come through as, as very interesting personalities, yes. you know, so where did you get uh, the bulk of the information from uh, from Gulbadan's uh, 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 from biography. Gulbadan's biography, even Babur's uh, biography. What is wonderful is that these early Mughals, men and women, are very candid in their biographies. There's no idea of a legacy or future readers. Uh, for example, Abu Al Fazl does that. He he watches over every word that he writes, so we don't get any indiscretion from him. But from Babur, from Gulbadan, you get all kinds of indiscreet uh, information about how the wives talk to each other, or, or about how Babur's 
clearly favored Maham Begum over all his other wives and how he, how he talks to her and how Bega Begum sometimes takes offense at Humayun's treatment of her. And he says, and she tells him, there are, no ro there are no thorns on the path to my house. Why don't you come visit me? Why are you always going to see your aunts instead? You know? mm -hmm. So you get these little snippets of information which bring them to life. So these may not be huge monumental empire building things, but they tell you something about the personality of these women, about how they were able to speak their minds and how the men found it very normal that they do so, something which we find much less later on, say in the time of Aurangzeb. You talked about how many of the Mughal women were very educated and they were also, you know, the people who carried forward the Timurid legacy. Yes. And Gulbadan comes to mind straight up, right? Yes. Because she actually did the biography of yes, her brother. That's right. and, and was was commissioned to actually yes. tell the early history of the Mughals. Yes, correct. You know? That's it's a fascinating episode, and it's Akbar because Akbar is the first king who has a real sense of uh, establishing a genealogy for the Mughal kings. He has the time; he has finally a huge empire, and and he asks. Of course, there's Abu al Fazl who's writing his biography and Badawni. But what is amazing is that he asks his old aunt and says, "You have direct experience of my father, you know, uh, and your father. So write whatever you remember." He tells her, "All your memories, write them down." And so it shows the trust he had in her uh, and also that her uh, capacities were such that as an elderly woman, she was able to sit down with her sisters-in-law, you know, Hamida Banu Begum, all these other ladies. And she wrote down all the memories she had from the time she was four years old and remembered her father coming into Hindustan, you know. So it shows how educated she was, how clear her vision was of what this legacy was going to mean for the future generations, how important her role was. She took it very seriously, you know, she was an older lady. She could have said, now, let me be now, you know, to enjoy my, my last days. She took it very seriously. She wrote a wonderful book. And the other aspect of this is that this biography, unfortunately, was lost to us for many centuries. So this is this tells us something about the memories of women. How they Why are. Why was it lost? Because no other biographer thought it important enough later on to refer to it. Whereas, for example, Abu al-Fazl is referred to constantly down the line, down the centuries, and there's no way we could have forgotten about Abu al-Fazl. But Gulbadan's biography is lost to memory for centuries. Nobody writes about her, nobody says there's a biography written by the sister uh, you know, of Humayun. So it says something about the legacy of women, how vulnerable it is to just neglect and, and for people to forget about it. Uh, and it's only in the late 19th century that uh, an English collector finds this document and then has it translated. Um, so uh, I liked uh, the story of Gulbuddin very much because it shows us the vulnerability of women's lives and their memory keeping and yet how important their memory is when we can access it because the information she gives us about the family life of the Mughals is something that no other biographer has deemed worthy to write about. Now the three phases in the Mughal women's genealogy if you were to look at it, that's Turkey, Yes. There is the Rajput and yes. then there is the Persian. Yes. Okay, so this yeah. is like three influences That's right. at three eras. Yes. You know, so I'm going to start off. What happens when the Rajput women start coming in from the time of Akbar? Yes, it's a fascinating episode in, in Mughal history really and one that I've uh, thought about a lot, you know, because in, uh, Akbar is the first king. Uh, who famously married uh, Harkabai, you know, who is uh, known as Jodabai, erroneously in, in popular culture. Uh, but so she was this, uh, the, the princess of Ambe, which later became Jaipur. And he then goes on to marry uh, about a dozen Rajput women. So you can imagine, and he allows these Hindu women to continue with their religion and their tradition. So they continue to burn the Vedic fires, they continue to offer, uh, you know, to, to carry out all their religious rites. And it makes you wonder how much of an influence they must have had on a king like Akbar, who was, as it is, so fascinated in religion and on all things spiritual. So the role of these Rajput women, I think, was truly remarkable in shaping what was to become the greatest of the, of the Mughal uh, kings, you know. Um, and along with that, I think somewhere came also the idea of a stricter zenana, a stricter parda. Because at the same time, the Rajput uh, system did have this, uh, this idea of a parda. Uh, and it developed along with the, um, the, 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 you know, the Islamic entry into India, but it was reinforced at the Mughal court because of the entry of all these women. And uh, both the Mughals and the Rajput kind of influenced each other and reinforced the idea of parda and a, and a closed zanana space. Mm -hmm. So the influence of these Rajput women was remarkable. And then of course, not just the women, but their relatives like Man Singh, uh, Raja Man Singh and Bhagwan Singh, all these great... And they played such a big role big in, role, in, the, big in, the, role, in you know? the establishment of the empire exactly you know? in spreading the ideas of empire because they took them to all the outposts of empire into the little corners of rajasthan into bengal into all these places where they became the leading generals and what is interesting is that they carried to these places not only their 
Hindu heritage, but the Mughal one. So they saw very clearly that their job was to spread Mughal ideas and the Mughal imperial, you know, imperial traditions to all corners of empire. I remember the miniature that you've put in the book, which is fantastic, of Harkabai having uh, her baby and you know um, uh, her mother-in-law sitting by yes. and there are uh, women from two stocks that's you know, right the Rajput and the Turki women yes. with, their, with their little caps yes. you know it's, it's, it's very interesting yes. to actually and, and those miniatures tell of that amalgamation it does they, they, they tell very clearly of a time of of a polyglot empire really a, a multicultural vibrant empire because you see these d dusky skinned you know Rajasthani women with their ordnays and their Rajasthani clothes at the same time a few remaining Timurid women, you know, with the, as you say, their Turkish high caps. And you wonder what language did they speak to, to each other? You know, there was the Rajasthani dialect, there was the Persian, there was the Turki. And all these influences were mixing and creating, of course, what became our wonderful uh, Mughal heritage, mm -hmm. something which is truly unique in the world. And the women must have been so very instrumental in the cuisine, in the clothes, in the religious rites, in shaping that culture. You know, what is also interesting is the parallel story that I, for the first time I got to know because of your book, of the financial might of these women. Yes. They were business women, they yes. were entrepreneurs, they were rich, because every time uh, the Padshah uh, or, uh, or, or, or the king or the emperor achieved something, he would give them a grant, he yes. would give them money. And Harkabai had a ship which went, took people to the Hajj. And that's she, right. She managed it and she got into trouble with, uh, with the, the Europeans. Portuguese, yes. And that's one of the reasons. Why, I mean, explain yeah. to us what happened. I mean, that's a fantastic story. It is a fantastic story. So Harkabai, you know, who is uh, in a way a very hidden woman because they don't even mention her name. It's very hard to get this name of Harkabai. You know, she's called Maria Muzamani, which is her, her title as, as Empress. Uh, and by that time, Abu al-Fazl and Akbar had decided that uh, the sanctity of the Mughal women was so great that you could not even pronounce their name. So it's hard to get at the real woman. But when you start to put together all her activities, you see a very ambitious woman, a very wealthy woman, a woman who is, who is very aware of her possibilities. So she has this trading ship, which was quite unusual for anybody really at that time, and certainly for a woman and a Hindu woman at that. And it's, so it's sailing in Portuguese waters, because our waters at that time were controlled by the Portuguese, and controlled quite violently so by the Portuguese, who would sometimes seize the Hajj ships. And for Harkabai to trade, uh, to have her ship sailing, she had to take a kartaz, which was a Portuguese pass. And that had an image of uh, Mother Mary, you know, or, or Jesus. So these are idolatrous and, and inimical both to the Rajput side of her and to her status as a Mughal queen. Uh, and she used to grumble a lot about this. And I think one of her ships was once delayed and seized. And uh, things came to such a pass, she went to her son, Jahangir at that time, the emperor, and said, you must do something. They have seized my ship. How dare they? I am, you know, empress. Uh, the Mughal Empress. And this actually led Jahangir to seize all communication with the Portuguese, which up till that time nobody had really done. Because the Portuguese were very violent and quite powerful, at least on the high seas. But Jahangir seized all communication. He removed all the grants that the Jesuit missionaries had till that point. He removed the grants from a church. And there was a sudden frother over all relationships between the Portuguese and Jahangir, solely because Harkabai's ship had been and seized. And in many senses, you know, Ira, while it's not a direct connection, it could be the reason why the Portuguese didn't make major inroads. Yes. And it's, the, it's the coming of the British who, it were, is. who were slightly more, you know, Careful in the way they Careful. dealt with, yeah, the, you see, the, 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 the local powers, definitely. Yeah. The Portuguese were very and cut and dry. And who thought Harkava would have, would have had, you know, because <laughs> in, in how the colonial you know, dynamics yes. worked. You know, because for the first time, the English saw that the Portuguese were fallible. Till then, nobody had dared attack the Portuguese on the high seas. Mm -hmm. But after this episode with Harkabai, the English wrote to their, you know, to their factors back home and said that this amazing, uh, you know, uh, happening has, hap uh, has taken place with the Portuguese and they have been uh, in fights with the Mughals because of the, the, queen mother, the Queen Mother's ships being seized. So the English slowly came to power after this and it did change completely the equation and dynamic with local rulers from there. So the three emperors, Akbar, Jahangir and Shah Jahan had a very strong Rajput connection. That's right. Right? After which comes the Persian women, yes. your, your Noor Jahan, your Jahan and yes. you know, Mumtaz yes. Mahal. What was the change then? What, what is the discernible change that you saw? The discernible change I saw uh, certainly with Noor Jahan coming in is that uh, she had this very strong Persian aesthetic, which, uh, you know, at that time it was sort of the, the gold standard was the Persian aesthetic, whether it was in music, in miniatures, in, in architecture, in ornamentation, you know, it was considered one of the hallmarks and she carried that very strongly. And it wasn't just Noor Jahan, it was her entire family who was extremely talented, whether her father, Itmatud Dola, later on, Asaf Khan, her 
her brother and even her pair, uh, her mother Asmat Begum, who actually developed uh, uh, Ittar of Roses um, at Jahangir's court. So there, there is a story that uh, Noor Jahan was responsible for the Lucknowi. Uh you know the embroidery on the muslin. Yes, I mean, is it, is yes. It true? Appa she apparently was extremely instrumental in all kinds of new clothing in uh, in a new type of cloth which was extremely light. Um, so all these things she did very much aligned with Jahangir's vision, which was similar. So uh, you know when people often wrongly say that she was this uh, sort of uh, it's Jahangir was enthralled to his wife, you know, as if she was doing something uh, inimical to the uh, to, to to the empire. This is not so at all. Her vision aligned perfectly with Jahangir. Uh, Jahangir was a great aesthete himself mm -hmm. and uh, um, she aligned her vision with his and helped him carry it forward. In some ways she carried it further than perhaps he would have been able to because by that time he was addicted to opium and alcohol as we know. So, but her aesthetic vision, which really for me the culmination is Itmad Dola's tomb, the, the, the absolute perfection of a jewel that it is, uh, is the culmination of her Persian aesthetic combined with Indian craftsmanship, which she brought to, you know, to, to fruition with this, uh, with this wonderful uh, tomb. We spoke about them as business people, as, as, as entrepreneurs almost, but we haven't spoken about the w women as builders. And that's one of the things that you speak about, that yes. they actually did build stuff. They did. And you see, uh, as you were talking about wealth early on, we forget about how very wealthy these women. First of all, the, the empire was the wealthiest in the world at that time. We often forget. We don't put India in relation to the world. We forget that we were the best, the greatest, the most glorious in the world at that time. So the women were the also the, the wealthiest and the greatest at that time because they inherited this wealth interestingly often through their mothers. Like Jahanara Begum, when Mumtaz Mahal died and Jahanara was just 17, she inherited fully half her mother's wealth, which was, I think, uh, at that time estimated at one crore of rupees. So they might, might, might have been well the wealthiest women in the world? In the time. world. At, I believe Jahanara was the wealthiest woman in the world at that time. Mm -hmm. She inherited 50 lakhs just the day her mother died. And if you think that the Taj Mahal took 50 lakhs to build, it's not an amount to be sneezed at. Uh, and then ad in addition to that, she had the revenues from the port of Surat. She had her trading ships. She had uh, revenue from villages. She had, besides all the gifts and jewelry that she was given every year. So she was an extremely wealthy woman. And uh, one of the ways in which she, and they were allowed to spend their four fortune as they wished, which was another remarkable thing to me. You know, she didn't have to obey any husband or any father. They did what they wanted with their money. Mm -hmm. And Jahanara Begum uh, um, created so many of the buildings in Shah Jahanabad. What is also interesting is by the time of Aurangzeb, you know, Shah Jahanabad turns its uh, nose on Aurangzeb, yes. literally. Because, you know, he's the guy who killed uh, yeah, Dara Shikoh. Dara Shikoh, yes. He uh, hurt his father. He was always the outsider, yes. you know, in that August circle. Yes. And he spends most of his life in the desert. Yes. And so Shah Jahanabad becomes uh, run by women, right? At that it time, it does. It does. It does. It, it becomes run by the nobility hmm. uh, and, and women within, and, and, yes. within the Mughal and family women, hold a very important. Uh, they do, though. Uh, um, Zebun Nesa, who was his eldest daughter and whom he loved dearly and who was a very cultured, remarkable woman who wrote poetry as well, he imprisoned her uh, because she, uh, at, after a certain time, because uh, uh, Aurangzeb lived till the age of 90, which was very long lived for that time. His grandsons were grown men by that time. So his sons were vying for position and they kept thinking he was going to pass away any moment. So at some point, Zebun Nesa sided with her brother. Mohammed Shah, I think. Mm -hmm. And when Aurangzeb finds out about it, even though he loved his daughter dearly, he imprisoned her in Salimgarh fort. And she spent the last 20 years of her life there. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, we don't have, and he forbade biography. He, he, this was such a traumatic thing for him that his beloved daughter turned against him, that he forbade all his biographers from writing. Nobody was allowed to write about her at all, you know. So we don't have a real diwan of her that we can say for sure are her, is her poetry. We don't have references to her. So we, she is lost to memory to a certain extent. But what we do have is the nobility who take over. So they take over the, uh, the musical evenings and the poetry evenings, you know, so the, it comes into their, uh, you know, control much more than the Mughal families. Then it becomes an era of decadence, right? Yes. Because you have Muhammad Shah's third wife, who's actually a courtesan. Yes. And who comes into the scene, and there's a yes. lot of internal politics. You, you left I off over here. Why <laughs> yes. do you not get into that period, which is, which is again, you know, you had Zinat Mahal, who was yes. a very fascinating woman, woman yes. Bahadur Shah's, uh, Zafar's wife. Yes. You didn't go that that far. No, Why? no. I stopped at Aurangzeb. I have to say, it was really for a uh, practical purpose. Uh, you know, I thought I had covered 
um, the systematic change of these women from the time of Babur to Aurangzeb. There's a, after Aurangzeb, there's a clear um, dissemination of that power. It's really no longer with the Mughal royalty anymore. It's almost a different phase. So I would have to write a part two of Daughters of the oh, Sun for <laughs> to cover that. <laughs> and what's interesting about that time, as you say, the power is no longer with the noble women. It goes much more into the, let us say, the second tier women, the courtesans who become queens. Uh, and so there's a very uh, different type of power that comes to play uh, with the fall of, say, after Aurangzeb. Last question, uh, Ira, you, you, you started on this journey of discovery of, of history late, you know, yes. you, you're a scientist <laughs> yes. by training. Correct. So what is the the comeback to history been like? <laughs> it has been, uh, you know, extraordinarily rewarding, really. I suppose I was not a terribly enthusiastic history student uh, in school. Uh, but at this stage of life, you have a different perspective on things. I do use my skill uh, as a scientist in doing my research, which has been very useful for me. It is also a way to see that actually in life, you use different skills at different times. You know, at a certain time, I thought, oh gosh, I've done all these years of science and I've never used it really in my life. But I'm able to use all those research skills now as a student of history in a way. Um, so it has been uh, extremely rewarding, uh, challenging also, but extremely rewarding to come to it at this stage and to be able to discover new things. Your next one is on Akbar. Yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big one. It is a big one. It is a man <laughs> to begin yeah, with. Yes. Yeah. So um, extremely challenging. I'm pretty nervous yeah. about, uh, about this. But I think uh, I would love to show him in a different light, show him in ways people haven't thought about seeing him through. Okay, all the best to Ira. Thank Can't you wait so for your much. new book. Thank you. Thank you so much. And keep the flag flying for women because even in Live History India, we've got a whole section called Her Story. That's wonderful. Which is really trying to look at history through the eyes of, of the women. Much who's needed. so been ignored. Absolutely. Through it all. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You.